This is the horrible sound of three small fish hopelessly trying to jump back into the life-saving element, the water of the Adriatic Sea. In the picture, three kids are standing on a pier in Bar in Montenegro, and on the cement in front of them are three fish. If this were an allegorical picture, who would be the three children and who the three fish? Since we are in the Balkans, many would think that the poor fish who helplessly arrive on the pier are the ethnic and religious minorities who characterize the peninsula and whose culture, livelihoods and sometimes lives are threatened by the different Balkan countries, majorities and authorities who in the picture are embodied by the almighty children. But there's another level not merely to the picture, but to the power relations in the Balkans. These violent waves crushing against the Montenegrin rocks are meant to represent the numb forces of time and of history that cannot be resisted rolling and crashing across the Balkans. For practically two millennia, different empires have divided the peninsula between themselves. From the second century, the Roman Empire occupied most of the region, and when in 395 AD it was divided into an eastern and a western part, so was the Balkans. The West Roman Empire succumbed to migrations and invasions in 476 AD, but the East Romans survived for another thousand years, later mostly called the Byzantine Empire, which in turn succumbed to the Ottoman Turks. During the 15th century, most of the Balkans became part of the Ottoman Empire, a part from the northwestern parts which were occupied by Vienna, becoming part of its Habsburg Empire which in 1867 became Austria-Hungary. In this way, different eras' great powers have carved the Balkans up between themselves, while the peoples of the Balkans have been just like the fish on the pier. Take the Serbs, who for centuries lived on the border between the Ottoman and the Habsburg Austro-Hungarian empires. They had to fight in both the Ottoman and the Habsburg Austro-Hungarian army, so that the wars between the two empires in effect often consisted of battles where Serbs fought Serbs. After World War I, the two empires dissolved and smaller, apparently sovereign states were formed which meant that peoples could no longer so obviously be pawns in the great powers' great game. But listen to what US President Carter's national security advisor, speaking of Brzezinski, in 1978 formulated as the ultimate goal of the United States in Yugoslavia. This goal was to get rid of communist rule in any form which is unsurprising. But after all that happened in Yugoslavia from the late 80s, the way Brzezinski wanted to get rid of communism in Yugoslavia is stunning. The last decade, Brzezinski said in 1978, it seems that history clearly shows that the idea of nationalism is stronger than the idea of communism. Brzezinski based this on perceived tensions between Russians and Ukrainians, Czechs and Slovaks, but also between Serbs and Croats, who all of them lived in so-called communist countries. In the long run, therefore, Brzezinski concluded, should be played on that card in Yugoslavia as well, so the resistance of communism can be weakened through the engagement of different nationalist tendencies. End of quote. 
And this was exactly what happened. Socialist Yugoslavia was weakened and then destroyed through the rise of nationalisms. Do I mean to say that Yugoslavia's dissolution and the war was set up by the US who fed the different Yugoslav republics nationalist movements? But that's another conspiracy theory. Of course it is, but conspiracies exist and it's pretty improbable that the US, like all other great powers, in 1978, when Yugoslavia's lifetime president Tito was 86 years old, did not think about how to gain influence in a Yugoslavia that was the key to the Balkans and which ever since World War II had been beyond its influence. It's also improbable that when he died two years later, they did not try to implement whatever plan they had to gain influence. Many ex-Yugoslavs believe that the great powers, the US, Germany, Great Britain especially, decided to destroy the country, which in no way means that they don't blame in particular the Serbs and Croats but also Bosniaks and Albanians, who did all the propaganda, not to mention the killing, burning of villages and expelling of people during the Yugoslav wars. They do blame them, because this is where the allegorical picture comes up short. People are not fish who helplessly writhe on the rocks, at least they need not be. In contrast to the fish, they are at least partly themselves to blame if they end up in that role. That wasn't true merely during the war in Yugoslavia, but everywhere and at all times. In the ex-Yugoslav region since the war, people are not forced to do what the great powers want them to. They are not fish on the rocks but the great powers have helped their leaders to get into power and they're supporting them in staying there as long as they do what the great powers tell them to. In that way, people in the Balkans are even today at the mercy of the great powers to the same degree as the fish on the pier are at the children's.